Thank you for joining us on Living History. Before we get started on this week's episode, don't forget about Peter Hart's Gallipoli book that's coming out. I hope you've heard about this. We've been talking about it for a while now. Peter Hart has written a book called The Gallipoli Evacuation, all about the evacuation of Gallipoli, surprisingly. And he's written that for Living History. For us, we're going to be publishing this book. And it's coming out in September. It'll be printed in September. But as of next week, we are going to be pre-selling the book on our website. So you can pre-order that book and then have it in your hand as soon as it comes out in September. And if you pre-order the book on the website, you will also receive a very special behind-the-scenes interview with Peter Hart. I've recorded it already. It goes for about two hours, and Peter breaks down everything about the evacuation, his motivation for writing the book, and most importantly, those wonderful sources that he used to tell the story. And we've included in that behind-the-scenes interview audio files, actual veterans in their own words talking about Gallipoli and the evacuation. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. So as of next week, go to the website, which is livinghistorytv.com and pre-order the book, The Gallipoli Evacuation. In the meantime, here's this week's podcast. A Living History Production. This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Living History and a topic where we're going back in time a little bit, back to the 19th century. This is a battle I think you will know of by name, but perhaps not so much the details. It's the Battle of Isetlawana. Uh, which took place in 1879, and a famous battle in the Zulu Wars, the British Redcoats versus the Zulus. I'm really excited about this one, and here to tell us all about it is military historian Dan Hill. Dan, thanks for coming on the program. Hi, Matt. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Really looking forward to, to having a chat with you. Now, I'm not even going to attempt to tackle the name too many times because it's confusing, But uh, <laughs> and for my Australian <laughs> tongue, it's difficult to get around. But tell us about the Battle of Isetlawana and why it's so important. Just give us the historic overview to begin with. What happened on this battlefield uh, and why is it so important today? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in the intro really there and you said it, it's one of those battles that actually a lot of people will know and a lot of people will be familiar with the name. But outside of that, actually, the, the, the history of this particular single day action that takes place in January 1879 is a, is a fascinating and, and tragic one in, in a more than one way actually um and in essence it's the uh, the opening engagement of the um british invasion of zululand which today we know as the the anglo zulu war um where a british column uh, under a, a colonel glynn actually more properly led by um the entire invasions commander a man by the name of lord chelmsford advanced into zululand with the aim of uh, bringing the zulu king um, a man by the name of Ketchwayo to battle, defeating him and subduing both his land and removing his army, um, thereby removing a risk to various British interests in, in what is modern South Africa. And uh, in essence, all of those aspects of the first part of the plan went completely smoothly. Uh, Chelmsford did invade Zululand. He did take a large column uh, backed with a major force of redcoats and uh, made his way and managed to bring... Uh, Ketchwayo's forces to battle and that's kind of where history uh, somebody screwed up the rule book and uh, and things went a little bit different because actually the Battle of San Luana um, progressed into being the largest and worst disaster in uh, British colonial um, history it was one column effectively or half of one column was almost completely annihilated to a man um, on that morning of the 22nd of January 1879 we should point out at this stage that this is the late 1800s. I mean, the, the British were using technology that was relatively modern. You know, we're talking artillery, we're talking uh, rifles. I mean, this this was a relatively recent conflict, and the, the Zulus were armed effectively with spears and shields. How did it go so wrong for the British? Well, it's um, if, if you like, you, you can really draw a comparison to a number of kind of s similar historical incidents. And it's worth pointing out there's an interesting uh, it's an interesting period of time for um, battles of this nature, because just three years before across in the United States, you have uh, General George Custer falling foul of uh, a 
native Indian force at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And there's so many similarities with that because once again, he's using, using modern weaponry, he's using modern tactics, and he's fighting a far more pr primitive yet more numerous enemy. And uh, he fatally splits his force. And all of those factors feed into the Battle of Isan Luana again. And, and, and really, it, it kind of comes back to this idea of, as you ask, how does it go wrong? Well, those two things are, are tied together by one particular aspect, which um, I suspect is going to be in history for, for quite a long time to come. And it's quite simply they underestimated their enemy. Numbers obviously played a huge part in this because there were, I think, had the numbers been equal on the British side and the Zulu side, there would have been no chance that the Zulus could have won. But obviously, the Zulus had a lot more, uh, a lot more men to uh, to bring into that fight, didn't they? Yeah, no doubt, and it actually plays into this whole underestimation um, thing because the numbers were so one sided. We're talking upwards of twenty thousand Zulu warriors who attack a, a British column, which if all told was about 1,800 men, more realistically, more like 1,300 combatant soldiers. And um, I mean, those numbers are huge, 20,000 against 1,300. But the, the British were supremely confident and uh, for a couple of reasons. One being that they had a massive force multiplier in their new modern technology, particularly the Martini Henry rifle and, as you say, a couple of pieces of artillery. And they're fighting an enemy who um, travel on foot, travel um, with cowhide shields and equal assegai uh, stabbing spears, albeit there are a few firearms on, on the battlefield and probably more than, than we generally give credit for from the Zulu side. But the Brits just don't understand that or don't believe that any sort of native, um, native force without a modern firelock is going to be able to do any damage and they find out in a very shocking way that morning that they're just not right. Well talk us through the stages of the battle what what happened when the British arrived and uh, and, and how did it all uh, unfold for them on the battlefield? So I mean Isan Luan has set the scene to a certain extent you, you need to imagine uh, that when Lord Chelmsford launches his, inv his invasion of Zululand which by the way is a, is a very very um, thinly veiled um, an invasion a true invasion the Brits are the bad guys in this piece put it that way and it wouldn't be for the first time in history um, so Chelmsford invades Zululand with three columns these columns are, are basically invading from the uh, from the north the south and and the central part of of Natal and the plan is to converge on on Quechua's royal kraal with something like 10,000 men and um, hopefully bring his army to battle and utterly destroy them there. Um, what they don't realise is going to happen is that Quechua actually comes out with his main forces, Impi as it's known, to meet um, to meet that threat and he decides that he's going to meet the largest and, and most central of those threats which is number three column under Chelmsford, Lord Chelmsford and Colonel Glynn. And um, he actually comes forward during the uh, during the first days of the invasion and manages to uh, to cause Chelmsford to split his troops fatally, I should add, because actually it's the splitting of Chelmsford's forces that makes really two bite-sized pieces rather than one one chunk of an army, which is going to be too much for the Zulu to handle. What they what they manage to do is to draw away about a uh, little over half of Chelmsford's forces down towards the southeast, where, where Chelmsford believes he's seen a main Zulu force up in some hills, and uh, he leaves behind a little under half of his entire invasion um, column force um, at a camp at a place called Isan Luana. Now, Isan Luana is a, is a mountain that, that sticks out on a plain with great views in, in a number of directions around, and, and the truth is that that column at Isan Luana that day have no role to play in the battle. Chelmsford has detached his most mobile force and he's gone off chasing what he thinks is the main Zulu army almost 12 miles away. And he's literally left a, a British camp with something over a thousand men inside it. And, um, and he doesn't realize that the Zulu actually, who are incredibly quick moving, have managed to steal around his flank and leave him scouting around in the hills looking for an army that isn't there because they've already slipped around his side and they're converging on Isan Luana itself. Talk to me about what it was like for the man on the ground. If you were a British, <laughs> a British soldier wearing a red coat that day and standing out in that field, what was that experience going to be like for you? Well, the early parts of the invasion are fascinating because there are still, even though we're talking 1879, there are still a number of letters that exist and uh, from private soldiers, from rankers as well, and they give a really interesting account of the the 
points leading up to the Battle of Isan Luana, and they talk about traveling through uh, through Zulu territory. They talk about how they don't expect any particularly stiff fight from the opposition, although a number of others also hint at the fact that actually the Zulu are a, a professional and dedicated force, and they warn against um, underestimating them, as which, as it turns out, was exactly what they should have been doing. But for the average man on the ground, you have to remember we're talking about a, a, a summer campaign in a um, in a very very warm country with men in their red coats and tropical gear, traipsing through uh, different terrains. This was actually a very very difficult movement to make, and these columns, particularly number three column, is incredibly slow. It takes nine miles to uh, takes nine days to do twelve miles, I should say. That's a very slow moving, ponderous kind of column. And, um, you know, for the man on the ground leading up to the battle, at least it's, um, it's just, I mean, it's, it's a typical Victorian battlefield where you've got slow moving troops moving towards a more primitive enemy, which of course leads us to this pivotal moment of the battle itself. Well, tell us all about that. Tell us what happens when the Zulus met the British on the field. Yeah, so, I mean, we're talking the morning of the 22nd of January, 1879. And uh, what happens is that the Brits who are in camp around Isan Luana with Chelmsford way off 12, 12 odd miles to the southeast, they're basically getting ready to pack up. It's early morning. They're having their breakfast about 7.30 in the morning. And a uh, Colonel Henry Pauline, who's taken over command of the camp whilst Chelmsford has, been, has uh, headed off, is um, basically seeing to the breaking down of the camp. At the same time, he receives an order saying that Zulu have been seen up off to the north and to the uh, to the east, which raises some massive red flags because there shouldn't be large parties of Zulu warriors anywhere near the camp. And uh, as a result, he calls the, the stand to, which uh, with no further sightings for an hour or so, ends up with him uh, allowing people to return to their now cold brekkie, which is a never particularly nice thing to do. But there has, that's the first sign of the day of this impending battle. It's not until another man under a, who commands something called Number 2 Column turns up that day. His name's uh, Colonel Anthony Durnford, an Irishman. He turns up to support Pauline in uh, breaking down the camp and moving up to meet Lord Chelmsford. Uh, he's horse-mounted and he actually sends out a number of patrols. And it's one under a lieutenant by the name of Charlie Raw, who is the first... When, uh, when exploring the ridges about five miles from camp, he, uh, he famously says that he spots a, a herd of cattle being shepherded away by some Zulu boys and decides he's going to give chase. And as he heads, heads off into the, uh, into the hills distant at the camp, he says he, uh, he has to pull on his reins to stop his horse from falling into a gully. And as he looks down, as far as the eye can see, he can see 20,000 Zulu warriors. In that exact moment that he sees them, uh, Charlie Raw, for whatever reason, he says, uh, Charlie Raw says it's because he's um, uh, attacked. Uh, Zulu records say it's, he's the one doing the attacking. Either way, Charlie Raw and his 50 blokes decide they're going to fire a volley into this mass pack of Zulus. And uh, he's effectively really poking the hornet's nest. And uh, the response is rather inevitable. And they come flooding out of the valley and 20,000 Zulus deploy and uh, and descend on the British camp, which is uh, in for one hell of a shock. So tell us about the battle. As the uh, I mean, it's it's terrifying even just to think of it as the the the, the numbers of Zulus descending on the hapless Brits. But uh, but tell us what happened next. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, as you point out, Matt, it's that it's that image, isn't it? It's it's uh, British redcoats sitting down to eat their uh, eat their breakfast. Um, already tired, already hot that day. And then all of a sudden, over this ridge a few miles from camp, you've got thousands and thousands of Zulu at a run, it should be said, heading towards the camp. And these these lads were quick as well. They were incredible endurance athletes and uh, and very, very powerful runners. And uh, in, in effect, within the space of 10 minutes of Charlie Roar discovering the, the main Zulu um, the main Zulu army, they've deployed in something called the Horns of the Buffalo, which is, which is a really well-known, if anybody's seen the film Zulu, really well-known uh, tactic that the Zulu use. And it's effectively a double envelopment. Horns of the Buffalo can best be described by, by imagining the shape of a buffalo and the two horns literally reaching around the sides and uh, enveloping an army completely whilst the, the chest as it's known as moved forward to engage the rest of the the force that's exactly what happens on this day and it should be mentioned at this point all credit to the zulu 
because the Zulu are incredibly skillful soldiers and they're able to deploy on, on a very, very primitive battlefield with no communication whatsoever into a, into a really well choreographed um, double envelopment with the, the horns over five miles apart. And in effect, they descend on, on the British camp with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pauline having, in his few spare moments, enough time to throw out a, a thin red line, uh, that typical British defensive uh, regular infantry posture. But it's worth mentioning, it is a very thin red line. He fatally overextends his defensive position around the camp, probably because he doesn't realise exactly how many Zulu he's facing. And his men are something like three to five yards apart in the skirmish line as thousands of Zulu descend on him. Now, even with one of the one of the very finest uh, um, modern day weapons, a breech loading Martini Henry rifle, odds of twenty or thirty to one are not going to go well. And actually, there are a number of in individual things that happen throughout the battle which spell the doom of those men in and around the camp that day. Well, talk us through that because I assume that the the it must have been a quite a ghastly scene. The the British opening fire with these modern rifles on men armed only with spears, but eventually being overwhelmed. Just uh, talk us through the, um, the, the the moments of that battle. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as you say, I mean, this was a shock in a number of ways. One was it was a shock to the Redcoats to see this uh, this enemy descending on them at such speed and with such ferocity. But secondly, it was one hell of a shock to the Zulu as well because to start being hit at 600 yards distance with disciplined uh, rifle fire, which is causing causing deaths at that distance, and then and then becomes almost a withering and an insurmountable fire at three or 400 yards was a real shock to the Zulu. They were used to fighting up close and personal, and actually that's where they excelled. Uh, the British position really was was held by, or was fatally flawed by one particular aspect, and that was um, Colonel Anthony Durnford, who'd arrived earlier that day with a couple of hundred um, troops, uh, mounted black African troops, very highly regarded, he was way off to the uh, to the east of the camp, if you imagine. So if you take a semicircle now, starting up to the north and northwest, and you head down towards the, the southeast, you can imagine that's approximately the British positions. Now, one of the big issues is the Zulu were attacking from south of the British positions. And it was left to one man, Colonel Durnford, with a couple of hundred troops to try and hold that entire front against the Zulu left horn, which was four or 5,000 men. And um, because of the, the overextension of the British line, as soon as Durnford's position fell, or he was forced to withdraw, one, through lack of ammunition, secondly, just through taking casualties, and third, through sheer weight of numbers, it opened and exposed the British uh, southern flank and a, a poor lad by the name of Charlie Pope and G Company of the 24th Regiment. And the Zulu left horn descended on, uh, on his open flank and managed to, if you like, knock down the concentric skills that were the British uh, front line at that time. And within a, a very short period of time, um, despite some, some very impressive defence from the Brits, they were completely overrun. And the moment the Zulus got in there in any number, it was, uh, it was really all over. The casualties on both sides must have been pretty horrific just by the nature of the fighting. How, how many men were killed on each side? Yes, I mean, staggering numbers. For, for a fairly small Victorian battlefield, the numbers are, are incredibly grim. So the, the main backbone of the British defensive forces that day was um, two was portions of the 1st Battalion, the 24th Regiment of Foot, and the 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot. Now, I'll get, to give you an idea, the casualty numbers for Redcoats in, the, in the, either of the two battalions that day amount to 99.75% deaths. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's extraordinary. That's outrageous. Basically, if you were in a red coat that day at San Luana, you're not going home. Only two men out of the entire battalion survived, um, both of them on horseback, and both of them after one hell of a, a terrible, perilous flight from the battlefield in the, the last moments being chased by Zulu all the way down an area known as uh, known as Fugitive's Drift. And um, the Fugitive Trail, I should say. And the... The reason it's so brutal is as soon as the, the Zulu managed to break into the, the rear part of the camp with their right horn and cut off a retreat and uh, managed to break in with their left horn by pushing Colonel Durnford back, they effectively completely envelop an entire British column. And uh, it, it turns into one awful, desperate f uh, fight and battle 
that's been um, actually memorialized in, in dozens of pictures during the Victorian period with, you know, that brave British red coat square, you know, fighting with uh, backs to their mates with bayonets pointed out towards the enemy. And that did happen, but the reality is the end of those squares was far more brutal as the camp was broken up and men started to bunch in twos and threes and tens and twenties and some very small, very determined stanza made. But in the end, those men are overcome and killed in, in the most brutal way, hand to hand, um, surrounded by hundreds of the enemy. So how many British were killed in the uh, in the battle? Total British um we're talking about 1,300 and um, give or take, and the Zulu casualties are much harder to estimate, and they're in the region of, you could say, 1,500 up to about 3,000. So the numbers are, are, are pretty uh, pretty astronomical. I can give you an exact rundown of the, the numbers. It tells us that somewhere in the region of 1,380 um, Brits and associated units are killed. So... Um, native horse natal native contingent and uh, imperial mounted infantry and various auxiliary units attached so it's around around 1300 total deaths it's just it's it's horrific the, the way you describe it and i mean we've all seen the movie and just the, the thought of just being surrounded and knowing that your days are numbered and i mean it's the same with custer's battle you know i've been to to custer's battlefield at little bighorn and just again the thought of just being surrounded and and you know that it's hopeless and you know that there's no escape. They're not going to take any prisoners. Just the, the last moments for those men must have been absolutely shocking. I mean, have you come across um, eyewitness accounts in your study of the battle? Yeah, and, and and when it comes to study in a particular battle, it's fascinating because actually the last moments of the um, of the British squares in and around the battlefield, of course, there, there are no British accounts because not one single man survives from that period. Um that being said, there there should be by rights thousands of Zulu, thousands of Zulu accounts, and uh, whilst there's no written tradition at that time in the in the uh, Zulu culture, there is a, a strong um, oral history tradition, and, and and that tells us about the the final moments and actually what happens to those uh, those men in those squares in the, the shadow of Isan Luana Mountain itself, and and two people stick in my mind. One of them is is a man commanding C company of the first battalion 24th foot, a man by the name of Reginald young husband and uh, young husband is probably one of the last formed bodies of troops on Isan Luana mountain at, at the end of the battle. And uh, the reason being that he manages to break off from this, this terrible fighting that's going on. And, and he actually scales Isan Luana, this high prominent rock out in the middle of this plane and manages to, to get about 50 of his blokes to put their their backs against the mountain itself, which at least protects them on one side. And uh, they put up some pretty stiff resistance, firing off the last of their rounds until eventually, um, inevitably, they run out of ammunition, which means you have men and bayonets, and and there's only ever going to be one outcome. But there's a really touching kind of Victorian moment in uh, in this episode, which is just as the, uh, very strangely, just as a, an eclipse that day is reaching its height, uh, which actually gives the Zulu um, modern name of the battle, the Day of the Dead Moon. Just as that's happening, a uh, young husband uh, reportedly, knowing that this is the end, goes along the line of his men, his 50-odd men lined up against the San Luana, one by one shakes their hand. And uh, just as he's finished that, a Zulu account from a Zulu warrior there says that he draws his sword whirls it around his head and as a group this 50 or 60 uh, exhausted and terrified men charge down into this mass of thousands of Zulus and put up a, a few seconds of fight before finally they're overcome. I mean that's a really powerful image for me that. Uh, what incredible bravery but bravery on both sides. I always think about these victories Dan where a, a native force overcomes the sort of imperial invaders if whether it's Custer's battlefield whether it's the British in in South Africa and I always think it's a bit of a pyrrhic victory for the for the native people because obviously they may win one battle but the response from the much more powerful uh, imperial force is going to be huge and terrible was was that the case after after this battle 
yeah exactly the case after this battle actually i mean the the reality is the um the invasion of zululand wasn't one that was supported by the british government in in 1879 it's a long story that i, I won't go into here but a chap by the name of sir bartle frere had come out with the idea of confederation of south africa and in the end he'd launched this invasion on his own account now once in isan luana happens the british public at home who are not um pro this battle at all all, all that is achieved in effect from Isan Luana is that they managed to mobilize um, passion in the United Kingdom against this invasion. And uh, despite the fact that this is a resounding Zulu victory, and, and I do see it that way, not, not a British disaster, but a Zulu victory, um, it, all it guarantees is that the British are going to come back with a vengeance and with numbers that Zulu are never going to be able to handle. It's also linked to the Battle of Rorke's Drift, isn't it? Another famous battle that took place at this time. Uh, how does how does Rorke's Drift relate to uh, Isandlwana? Yeah, very much so. In fact, uh, Rorke's Drift is some 12 miles from Isandlwana. And, and in essence, what we've just described is the main battle of the day, the Battle of Isandlwana. The the sub-battle, if you like, or the, the much smaller part of that, is that the uh, the Zulu reserve, who don't manage to, to fight at Isandlwana that day, are somewhat frustrated. It's, a, it's a, um, a regiment called the Undi Corps, or Corps called the Undi, who haven't managed to, to get involved in the fighting. And uh, they've heard that there's a very small group of men, somewhere in the region of 100 to 150 men, 12 miles away, guarding the, the route that Chelmsford has actually crossed into Zululand from. And uh, despite not being, a, or being specifically told not to cross into Natal, they decide that they're going to do this. And around 4,000 men descend on about 150 blokes at this uh, mission station at a place called Rourke's Drift. And uh, even though a 1,000 regulars during the day couldn't defend at Isan Luana, these 150 men do manage to hold off Rourke's Drift in, in a, an incredible battle that is quite rightly sees a number of Victoria Crosses, um, the highest in one single day, in fact. It's such an epic, this whole tale, this, this you know, the, the, the colonial period, the Victorian era, the Redcoats versus the natives. I mean, there's just so many elements of this story that make it compelling. How is this battle remembered today? I mean, I understand I've never been to the battlefield, but I understand that it's a really wonderful battlefield to, to visit. How do we remember this, uh, this, this battlefield so many centuries later? Well, it's, um, we've already kind of made the, um, made the close association between uh, Isan Luana and, and the Battle of Little Bighorn already. And actually, when it comes to recognizing battlefields, they've got another thing in common, and, and it's a really rare one, and that's that the fallen on both of those battlefields are actually marked by um, by markers on the spot where they fell. So in essence, you can you can freeze frame the last moments of that battle. Whereas on uh, at the Little Bighorn, you've got individual grave markers marking the the location of fallen troopers the same thing happens here at Isan Luana but it's done with with cairns of white rocks so as you can walk around the preserved battlefield today you can actually still see the spot where those last groups of men fell either those around the mountain itself or one one young man um, who with probably the last surviving group of the 24th foot made it a few miles back towards uh, towards safety in Natal and uh, it's worth pointing out for your for your Aussie roots, your Aussie listeners here. Um, his name was Edgar Anstey, and he was very likely one of the very first Australians, Australian-born men to be killed in throughout military history. Dying in 1879, he was actually born just uh, just outside Adelaide, and uh, found himself in faraway South Africa fighting for the British in 1879. So one for your your listeners there. But in terms of, of actually recognising the battlefield today, the, the Zulu people who still occupy that land or the descendants of are uh, uh, rightly incredibly proud of, of the, um, the courage and determination that their ancestors showed that day. And, uh, you know, even today, all these 140 odd years later, the Battle of Isan Luana is still very much alive and kicking. There's a lot of controversy about the fighting that goes on here. Um, largely because one half of the battle, certainly the second half of the battle, is almost undocumented because the truth is nobody lives to tell the tale. What about in the UK? How is this battle remembered and should it be remembered in a different way? Yeah, the, the, in the UK, I suppose this, this battle is, is best known um, as a, a terrible defeat by the, uh, of the British. And, and the truth is, yeah, you can't really go too wrong in saying that. Look, it, almost one entire column is destroyed 
um, in a single morning by a, by a native force that's been totally underestimated. My own take on this is rather than this being a, a British disaster, um, it's not. It's a Zulu victory because all of the mistakes that the Brits make that day, they're all caused by skillful Zulu management of the battlefield and also just the, the sheer determination of the man on the ground. And yeah, it takes uh, it takes some mistakes for the British force to be broken up. It takes some some missed opportunities from the Brits, which might have saved the day. But the truth is that it should be remembered as a, a Zulu victory and one which uh, which a, a native army manages to outmaneuver and outfight a professional British force. It's just such an epic story, Dan. It's just there's there's so many emotive elements to this whole thing. And just thank you so much for coming on and sharing it with us. Before you go, what are you working on now? What are we going to see next from Dan Hill? Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Well, uh, all sorts at the moment. I suppose like everybody else in the in the history and particularly the battlefield guiding world, just waiting really for the uh, the globe to start spinning in the correct direction. But, you know, in the t- for the time being, at least, um, lots of exciting things. I'm working on a historical talk series at the moment called History from Home, which is a twice weekly um free historical talks on on a subject from military history ranging from uh, the battle of bosworth right through to the falklands war so that's taking up a lot of time and, and having good fun with that and hoping to have you along soon matt to come and join us well i'd love to mate where can people find that if they want to tune in so they can find us um either at my website which is downhillmilitaryhistorian.com or just keeping an eye on twitter and general social media for anything under the hashtag history from home so Wednesday and Sunday nights, um, 7.30 UK time, we'll be doing a, a couple of talks with a um, you know, different number of speakers from all over history. Fantastic. Well, I suggest everyone checks that out and also follow Dan on Twitter because he's always got great things to post. I enjoy uh, seeing your tweets, Dan, and retweeting them when I have the opportunity. Mate, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us. My pleasure. Thanks for listening and uh, what a fantastic job you guys all do. And, uh, you know, look forward to, to catching up soon. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast and visit livinghistorytv.com for more great history content.